Please welcome Tristan Harris, co-founder and executive director of the Center for Humane Technology. And Deb Roy, professor of media arts and sciences, MIT Media Lab, and co-founder and executive chairman of Cortico. Well, welcome Tristan Harris to the Media Lab. Thanks for having me, good to see you. Can you hear me? Good to see you. So I think um, we should just start off by hearing a little bit about this event. You just had a big event in San Francisco two weeks ago. Um, what was that about and what happened? Yeah, um, so for those who don't know uh, the background, what, what brings us here, uh, I run a, a nonprofit called the Center for Humane Technology, where we focus on realigning technology with humanity from a self-destructive path to a non-self-destructive path, uh, specifically working on issues of social media, device addiction, polarization, things like that. And we held this event in San Francisco uh, last two weeks ago to move from a kind of incoherent agenda of scandals and grievances. If you ask people, what's wrong with the tech industry right now? And when I say the tech industry, I mean social media. So if you ask people, what's wrong with Facebook and Google? You get, oh, they screwed our data, they, you know, they're polarizing people, there's these elections, something about Brexit, something about the 2016, but it's not coherent. No one can tell you what's wrong. And so we invited 300 people from you know, the founder of Apple, the founders of Lyft, Pinterest, design teams, uh, so non-civil society groups, uh, activists, media, to set a coherent agenda about what's wrong. Because if you think about, for example, the problems of tech addiction, like we're hooked to our phones, polarization, why are we so polarized, outrage, why does it seem like all of our politics is just outrage all the time, vanityification, why are kids so obsessed with how much attention they're getting from other people and everyone has a YouTube channel? Uh, these seem like separate issues, right? They're not connected. But are they disconnected? Or are they actually all coming from one source, which is the race to the bottom of the brainstem to extract attention? And so what we're trying to say and what we held this event to do was to go from, oh my god, there's these different issues and we have to have different policies and different design strategies to a coherent agenda that says there's a missing item from the global agenda which is kind of equivalent to social climate change or the climate change of culture, which we call human downgrading. That while technology was in a race to suck and drill you know, attention out of human souls to upgrade the machines, it's been downgrading humans, downgrading attention spans, downgrading civility and decency, downgrading democracy, downgrading mental health. Uh, I'm not trying to be negative, it's just that we need to connect these issues together, and so we call that human downgrading. And we think that it deserves a spot on the global agenda that's as big as climate change, because essentially, uh, about two billion people, uh, you know, more than two billion people use smartphones, and this is the choke point for sense-making and decision-making for everybody. So we check these things about 80 times a day from the moment you wake up in the morning and you undo your alarm to the moment you go to bed at night and set your alarm. I've got you pretty much jacked in. Uh, when I was at Google, I was a design ethicist where I was studying uh, how do you ethically steer two billion people's thoughts. So this is kind of the, the long trajectory of a project. It says, what do you do when you're holding in your hand two billion people's attention? and you're actually creating a race to the bottom for how do we get that attention. And that's what's creating all these problems in politics, election engineering, Russian interference, uh, polarization, vanityification, mental health of kids, they're all connected issues. So how much of when you, I love the framing, the race to the bottom of the brainstem, is the critique of the technology versus a critique of the brainstem. And you know, there's human nature that's being amplified, presumably, um, the internet and social media are doing good things as well. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you see a way to sort out the negative effects from the positive effects, which are both arguably amplifying the same brainstem dynamics? Right. Um, do, you, do you think this is a, is it a viable project to keep the good while pulling out the bad? Or in trying to bring the bad under control, do we have to give up some of the good? Yeah, it's such a great question. I mean, the, the way that I think about this is that we're fixed. You know, your neurological hardware is baked. My favorite um, the father of sociobiology, E.O. Wilson, said that the fundamental problem of humanity is that we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, 
and godlike technology. So we're basically chimps with nukes with 17th century governance institutions. And the tech is you know, accelerating like that. So when we say we need to realign technology with humanity, what we really mean is when you stare in the mirror and you realize that you're running you know, millions of years old hardware that has these basic bugs in it, bugs slash biases, you know, features, that are features on the savanna, but they're bugs in today's environment. And we only have one choice. Either you make technology in our environments, you know, wrap around that hardware in an empowering way. You make it work with our hardware, almost like an ergonomic chair, or you don't. And so you know, the joke now is technology is wrapping your lizard brain like a perfect glove. Like it's perfectly wrapping the reptilian parts of your brain because the attention economy wants to domesticate human beings to be most extractable for attention. So what I mean by that is almost like you, know, you domesticate a cow, so you get, you know, or not domesticate, but you, you, you turn it into the kind of cow you can get the most meat and dairy from. We've become, become the kind of human animal that is easiest to get attention from. So maybe um, we can talk a little bit about, um, in terms of thinking about directions you think we should head to, yep. to get things under control. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, regulation. Um, now that means one thing if you are running a company, you think about regulation, but if you put the word self in front of regulation, self-regulation, and maybe if we think about it at a couple of different levels, yeah. um, there is an entire country or maybe even the species self-regulating, and we don't really have a global, I don't think the UN is up to the, to the, to the job perhaps, but each government, right, and here uh, in the United States, obviously there's a lot of activity now uh, in Congress thinking about how do we regulate. So let's take that as one level. Platform is another level. What should Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, let's just pick those three as the obvious ones, uh, Instagram maybe, do. Um, and then in terms of we the people, um, how should all of us in this room, some of whom probably will look at their phone three or four times in the next 10 minutes, what do we do uh, to sort of break the addiction or to think about self-regulation of the individual. Um, so I've just stacked up enough to keep us going for yeah, exactly. 10 minutes. So just use yeah. all the time. Three um, levels, at least, maybe, or is, are, are there more than three levels would be another. Well, so when you think about regulation, I think I always go back to Mark Andreessen's quote that software is eating the world. Um, because it, it's important that you, when we're tracking all these issues, we track them historically and also where they're all going. So these are all trends. So. When Mark Andreessen said software is eating the world, what he really means is software and technology can do everything that it can do more efficiently, so it'll gradually just eat up every domain of life. Used to have Saturday morning cartoons controlled by some human beings that are deciding, maybe you have some child psychologists you hire who are asking what's good for kids. And then you say, no, 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 software can do that better. Let's have YouTube for kids gobble up that part of the attention economy. You have elections run by the public square, governments, the Federal Election Committee, but then Facebook comes in and says, let's make election advertising more efficient, so they come and gobble up that part of it. But what you have when you have technology or software eating the world is you have deregulation eating the world. You have privatization eating the world. Because what used to be a public domain of life, like Saturday morning cartoons, or you know, teenagers' mental health, or um, you know, elections, suddenly gets gobbled up by the incentives of whatever Facebook wants to do. And what's in Facebook's best interest is not in the best interest of Burma or Sri Lanka or Angola or you know, the elections of the United States. So I say that because thinking as a policymaker, there's two kinds of policies. Once you realize that we've deregulated something that used to be protected, like let's say with elections, we used to have fair campaign ads. So 7 p.m. on a Tuesday night, it should cost the same amount of money for Hillary Clinton or Trump to run an ad. But then when you let Facebook gobble that up, suddenly, all bets are off. It's a totally different system run by an auction by a private company incentivized to do what's good for Facebook. So the first thing we can do from a policy perspective is recognize what were pro uh, protections that we lost that we want to bring back. So uh, how do you bring back uh, fair pricing in elections? How do you bring back protections for kids' mental health? Um, protect Saturday mornings, things like that. Then you have the new issues of how do you regulate something that is essentially a global platform that um, you know, I think what people misunderestimate or underestimate massively about this is uh, the scale and uncontrollability of these digital Frankensteins that are basically um, 
influencing the elections, the cultures of, of societies where they don't even speak the language. So for example, how many people here know about the sort of pedophilia stuff that's on YouTube? Have you heard about this? No? I'll give you some, a couple of examples. So, um, so if you didn't know, Facebook is more than 2.3 billion users. That's more than the size of Christianity. YouTube is uh, 2 billion users. It's about the size of Islam. And uh, when you think about that scope of psychological influence, you think, OK, well, these are just tools. Why should the platforms be responsible for what they're doing? But in fact, uh, when you hit play on a YouTube video, 70% of the plays on YouTube now are driven by the recommendation system because they're calculating what's best to show you. So the example here is you're about to hit play on a YouTube video, and you think I'm going to watch this one video, and then I'm done because I've got to get back to solving all these problems. But then what happens is you wake up from a trance two hours later, and you're like, what the hell just happened to me? And the reason that that happened is when you hit play on that YouTube video, YouTube in its server wakes up like an avatar model voodoo doll-like version of you. And based on all of the clicks you've ever made, that's like your hair clippings and your nail, nail filings, it makes this voodoo doll act more and more like you. So then they can prick the voodoo doll with 100 million videos and say, well, if I pricked you with this Alex Jones video or this pedophilia video or this um, conspiracy theory, this is how long it would get you to stay. And it's calculating and simulating so many different possibilities on your little avatar that it's, it's an asymmetric relationship. And that's the reason that it's right underneath our nose. AI has already sort of taken over the pen of history because we're in this asymmetric relationship. It sees more moves ahead on the chessboard. If you think about this like Gary Kasparov, uh, why does Gary you know, win or lose chess? Why does he beat us at chess? Because he just sees and he can simulate more possibilities. But when he loses against the computer, it's because the computer can simulate more possibilities than Gary. And when he loses, he loses for all of humanity for all time because it just simulates more possibilities. But now you have a situation where 2 billion human social animals are jacked into YouTube, and it's playing chess against our minds, and it's winning, which is why 70% of YouTube's traffic is driven by recommendations. So I'm setting this up for a reason, because you have to understand these are not just these neutral tools that you walk in, you do what you want, and you walk out. There's this whole army of engineers and supercomputers that are, that are tilting the playing field. Because if you imagine a spectrum from the, let's say this is a spectrum on YouTube, this is the calm side of YouTube, like Walter Cronkite, uh, David Attenborough, Calm Science, et cetera. And then you have, on the other side, you have crazy town. You have Bigfoot, UFOs, conspiracy theories, that no matter where you land on YouTube, if you land in the calm side or the crazy side, if I want you to watch more, which direction am I going to send you? I'm always going to send you that way. So it tilts the whole playing field in this direction. And if you take a teen girl and she watches a dieting video, it'll recommend anorexia videos. Uh, because those were the good things that happened to watch, uh, get people to watch longer. If you took someone watching a 9-11 news video, it recommended Alex Jones conspiracy theories. It recommended that 15 billion times. And you can hire, as YouTube has done, um, uh, joke, jokingly call them boulder catchers or content moderators. They can hire 10,000 content moderators to say, we're going to block these bad pieces of conspiracy theories. And they've actually taken off the Alex Jones problem. They've taken off the um, conspiracy theories and the teen dieting videos or the, uh, the anorexia videos, but how many engineers at YouTube speak the 22 languages of India, where there's an election coming up uh, next, uh, how, many, how many weeks from now? Like three weeks from now. Yeah, I don't know exactly, but it's yeah. rolling over it's, several it, weeks. Yeah. So I say this because this is what lets you see the situation that we're trying to regulate. So if we're going to regulate it, we have to understand what is the thing we're trying to do. Is it just that these are neutral tools and we have to, people can't protect themselves, or is it the technology is itself controlling the pen of history, and it's tilting the playing field in languages that we don't speak. So once you set it up this way, the kind of reform we want isn't we need to hire more content moderators. It isn't we need to, um, you know, what we really need to do is move from an extractive attention economy that's basically treating attention as this fungible resource that we have to pull out of people. And your conscious mind gets parked over there, but I'm going to run in there and crawl into getting you addicted to attention. We need to move from that to a regenerative econ attention economy, because we still, we still need attention from people. right? We can't get rid of that, just like we still need energy. But there's a difference between the kind of energy that's, that's gotten through extraction and pollution, you privately pop profit and publicly harm, and the kind of attention economy where people voluntarily give you their attention, and you don't profit directly from the attention itself. You profit from the outcome of getting people to where they want to go. I guess the, the challenge here is, um that social media is not the only 
business that profits off of attention. In fact, the entire for-profit media industry, I would put in that category, the entertainment industry, more generally beyond media, right. if you're a game maker, and you can sort of keep going. Um, I'm not suggesting that your critique isn't, it, it seems right on, um, except that it's hard to draw a sharp line anymore. And meanwhile, these classic industries, of course, have digitized, and they are upping their game and the abilities of mining human data and creating these AI better, better engines, models, yeah. right? Um, it's it, that those capabilities are spreading. So I'll, I'll say, since we only have two and a half minutes, that was layer one of self-regulation. Yeah. Right. Um, let's just jump to the top of the stack, uh, by which I mean individuals. Um, you know, I think you've really convincingly used the analogy of an addiction, and that you know the um, the maker of the addictive substances have this asymmetric power of AI and technology, and there are responsibilities that go with it. And I think we're grappling, I think the platforms are grappling with how to um, balance profit with that responsibility. And there's the underlying threat of regulation with a really blunt instrument, like Sri Lanka says, oh, we can regulate. It's called, called the off switch, right? And a lot of good stuff turns off with it. Right. So that's sort of uh, a kind of platform and, um, and, and, and sort of government regulation. Uh, how about individuals? I mean, if we have an addiction, there's uh, certain things we can try to do um, to self-regulate and to, uh, do, you, yeah. do you have any, the, the uh, reason, any the, sense of what we should be thinking about on that front? Just again. Well, the, the reason that we focus on this asymmetry and the voodoo doll metaphor and you know, all that is because it's, it's so as asymmetrically powerful that we need the companies themselves to change their behavior because we actually inhabit this environment. It's our new social environment. Mm -hmm. Um, but I will say that when it comes to changing the incentives, Apple and Google are actually in a fantastic position to change the currency. So they're like the central banks of the attention economy. They're like the Federal Reserve. So the App Store, the uh, notification system, the way your home screen works. Right now, they say, we're just building this, this you know, set of icons. And every icon can choose what it wants to do. And basically, once you open that icon, it gets full screen access to the screen and it has root access to crawl into your nervous system and do whatever it wants. But they could say, hey, what do we want this to be for? Maybe instead of apps, we actually have things that are just about helping people with their life. Meaning, um, you're right that in every other medium, in gaming and media, there is an attention economy. But the reason I was so optimistic about this field is that this is the one place where technology doesn't have to replicate those other dynamics. It could be about how do we just help people have what they want. And one last example, since I know we're over time, is uh, let's say you um, wanted to be out there dating. You're looking for a connection. And today, you open up one of these apps or something, and the incentive is to keep you swiping for as long as possible, turn your faces into a slot machine. And what this other new world, this regenerative attention economy would work, is that these companies would use all their data and all their power to say, OK, Deb is looking for a connection. Like, who's got, who can help Deb? And there's like red alarm bells going off and Facebook like scrambles and says, okay, gosh, what are we gonna do to help Deb? And they, they look through his social network and they say, hey, he has this friend who, who's, who's really good at hosting dinners and, if, and we can offer him a choice to send her a message to say, hey, would you be willing to host dinners for single friends? And Facebook could say, oh, no, we have this other choice. We have this, this list of friends who like going to salsa classes and that actually works really well for helping people who are single. And I'm saying this because this is like flipping the competition around. They're still competing, but they're competing to help people, not to hook you. So. Sounds like an idea for a new nonprofit social media company. Yes. Thank you Definitely. so much, Tristan. Thank you. Thank you.